got that out of it. It'll bless you. In Hebrews chapter 12, and I want to begin reading in verse number 12. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 12. <clears throat> we'll try to read you the word of the Lord today and preach to us. I, I, I'd love to see God just say, I asked you for last night when we get ready to go to bed, I said, what should we pray? Should we pray for 50 people to show up in the morning and all get saved? Or should we pray the Holy Ghost just falls and blesses those of us that's there and lets us shout and enjoy? And, and so we both was going to choose the 50, but since the 50 didn't show up, I guess God let us let us both have a little shout this morning. And, and uh, if the 50 didn't come, I, I, I don't want to turn down a blessing from the Lord. <laughs> Praise God. Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 12 said, Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled, lest there be any fornicator, profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For you know how that afterward, when he would inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. This from really verse 4, as we go down through, you know, verse 18, verse 20, somewhere in there, uh, the apostle is given an appeal to people for endurance and talking to them about uh, the Lord chastening those that he loves. It's, there's an exhortation to endurance here. But in verse number 12, he begins a new thought. And really that same thought continues through about verse 17. And, and he starts into that telling us to lift up hands that are hanging down. And, and it says, and the feeble knees, which really is being an to strengthen or to confirm or, or reaffirm the feeble knees. And make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame. Make straight paths for your feet if you don't, lest, in other words, if you don't, you may be lame. If, if the path is crooked, if the path is overgrown with briars, if the path is, uh, is unpassable, it may be like it was, brother, one of those books back there, you may read it, where they're asking directions to Prim, Arkansas. Stop and ask the man how the best way to go to Prim. And he said, walk. And, and if you've never been to Prim, I concur with that. The best way to get there is by foot or helicopter because uh, the roads are so curvy and windy that they're just not a good way to get there from here. And so the, the writer said, make straight paths for your feet because if the road's not good or if the road's not just right, you're liable to be lame, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, because a lame man couldn't walk on an uneven path, or a rocky path, or a crooked path, a winding path, a briary path, a thorny path. If a man's lame in his feet, he needs a pretty straight path to walk on. If not, it says, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. I want to try to preach to you in just a few minutes this morning on how to handle the handicapped. A lot of things is done in the world to ensure the best possible outcome for handicapped people. That's why that there are, you know, and I don't like, I just, for the sake of time, I can't allow myself to get too far off, as Brother Darrell Tolliver says, in the weeds right here. But, you know, there's approximately 7,000, maybe just under that, parking places outside Walmart for the handicapped. And, and I see about, if there's 7,000 parking places, there's about three handicapped people in them and the rest of them just so fat they can't get around. So, you know, that, that won't cost you anything. But, but uh, the, the handicapped parking place are really not for the obese. It's for the handicapped. It's for the man, woman, boy, or girl who can't walk very well or walk very far. They don't really have parking places for fat people, but usually what ends up happening is they get a little parking sticker and they end up in the handicap.
handicapped place, and it's all the fat people take it up, and the handicapped people are parking out in the regular parking places with all of us and trying to cripple their way to the door because fat folks got in the way. Anyway, there's the weed sermon for you right there. But the, the handicapped parking places are important for the handicapped. Yes. They don't benefit me. I don't necessarily need them. Except if it's raining or snowy or cold or a little too hot or a little too fat. The handicapped parking places are very important for the handicapped. And I'll I just say this, shame on you if you take up one of them and you're not handicapped. Shame on you. Got to hear at least one amen on that. Amen. If you're, if you're not handicapped. Now, I park sometimes in a handicapped place over here at the post office. Because really, if you park in front of the post office, there's only, there's almost all there is is a handicapped spot there. And so usually when I'm there, it's after church on Thursday night. And after church on Sunday night, and there's not typically a lot of handicapped people going in there in the middle of the night getting their mail. So I usually actually pull in sideways and just let Sister Jennifer out at the door and she goes in and grabs me and we go. But I don't believe in taking up a handicapped spot. You're not handicapped. There is a way to handle handicapped people. Yes. And the writer here said, we don't want to just turn the handicapped people out. We don't want to just push them aside. We'd like to see them get help. If they're handicapped. There's, you know, when you're, when you're in, a, in a restaurant or in a store, uh, and I, how do I get in these places? Uh, open the door for ladies. And for handicapped people. And for old people. Is that okay? Is that good preaching? Brother David, is that pretty good right there? Open the door. If you see someone coming up on a walker and they're just barely able to get around, don't rush in ahead of them. Let the door slam in their face. They may have tried to open it. Stop and wait for them. It'll be you after a while by the grace of God and you'll need somebody to open the door for you. There is a really a right way to handle handicapped people. And it has been at times that you see, it almost seemed like that society for a space of time wanted to hide the handicapped. Let's stick them all in an institution somewhere and forget about them. Let's not, let's not let them mesh in with the rest of society. This particular wording in this right here, unless that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. And, and then he goes immediately into talking about following peace with all men and holiness. This could be, being as this is so far over in the New Testament, this could be, a reference back to Isaiah 35. A highway shall be there and a way. It shall be called the way of homeless. The unclean will not pass over it. But it shall be for those. The weight bearing them. No fools shall not err therein. And that the passage there in Isaiah. Even talks about the lame leaping. Talks about handicap issues in there. This yeah. could be a correlation between the two. This writer here encourages us to help. To strengthen. To build up. He even, he even really turns poetic and, and starts talking about heroism right here. Lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. The, the, the implication here is to not segregate the handicapped, but to integrate the handicapped. It almost seems like that a lot of churches in America would rather segregate the handicapped. Mm -hmm. You know what segregation is, don't you? Yeah. Some of you is old enough to remember the Jim Crow laws. Some of you is old enough to remember the Civil Rights War. That even, even, even from 1865, four, when, when Lincoln emancipated the slaves, really for a hundred years after that, they weren't slaves, but they wasn't very far from it. Jesus, Help me while I preach. Help him, Jesus. I know we're south of the Mason-Dixon line. I also know the blood of Jesus is for everybody. Amen. There was, there, was, there was a freedom from slavery, but the slave people, the, the African American, the Negro people were still segregated. Mm -hmm. When Daddy went to school, they had a, a nice water fountain that said whites above it, and they had a pipe sticking out of the wall over here that said colors above that. And we don't mind you having a drink of water, but you ain't drinking out of our pipe, you know. We don't mind you riding on the bus, but you're not riding on the same part of the bus with us. You're all going to help me this morning. Help 
I'll tell you what, it is not in the kingdom of God. There is no such thing as segregation for the handicapped or the segregation of races or the segregation of sex. And what it is in the kingdom of God is integration. That they begin to take away the segregation and begin to implement integration. They started allowing the colored people to drink out of the same water fountain, right in the same places in the bus. And it, it, if we're not careful, we develop a bigoted ideology of Christianity. We, 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 wouldn't, we don't like to think of ourselves as the kind of people that want to enslave someone because of the color of their skin. But, but those same people don't mind putting the handicapped spiritually over to the side. We really don't know what to do with you. Uh -oh. Y'all hear? I mean, uh -oh. handicapped people, man. I had an uncle that, that had, uh, had issues like that, and, and because of really a lot of it had to do with a, 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 a runaway wagon during a corn harvest when they were children. And the wagon turned over, dumped Uncle Tommy out, and he hit his head, and he began to have epileptic seizures after that. And so as, as we grew up, we grew up, we loved Uncle Tommy. I preached his funeral. And, and, but, but the thing is, there's people that want to take Help those kind of people that have an issue, and we just want to put them over here to the side. I mean, there's people that have a handicapped child that want to give it up for adoption because they don't want to raise Help something. God. It's not just so-so. We have a lot of friends, we have several different friends that have children that were born with Down syndrome. Yes. They didn't ask to be born with it any more than you asked to be born without it. Amen. They can't help that. They didn't ask to be born that way. They're important to God. Yes. I said Brother Dustin Brown's funeral, uh, or visitation rather, some weeks ago. There's a lot of preachers there that I haven't seen in a while. And I enjoyed visiting them and enjoyed visiting other folks that I haven't seen in some time, some of them for many years. And But there was one man, two really, that came into that visitation that thrilled my heart as much as I enjoyed shaking Brother Aaron Brock's hand. And we reverence him. He's a great man. And I appreciate Brother Aaron. I appreciate Sister Shirley Lester. And I appreciate the other ministers that was there. But I want to tell you something. When, the, when, when Kent Brown, the handicapped boy with Down syndrome, when he locked eyes with me and his face lit up like a million oh, Christmas bulbs, and he come running down the aisle with his arms out on the hug my leg, I'm telling you that does me as much good as any preacher whose yeah. hand I shook. And it wasn't very long after I shook hands with Kent that I walked on down, down there with Steve Lankins, another young man that's got a handicap. And Steve recognized me and wanted to talk to me. I'm telling you this morning, we are not in the business in the that's kingdom right. of God. No. In the economy of heaven, no. in hiding right. the handicap. He said, lest that which is let him would be turned out of the way or pushed aside, but let it rather be healed. Yes. Amen. I'm driving down the road the other day. Uh, yesterday, I guess it was, and I was praying about the service, and we, we were driving to eat. When we work like that, a lot of times Jennifer seems to get a pretty strong desire to go out and eat. You know, we don't want to have to go home, get five people showers, and then start cooking. And so she began to mention eating out, and then she began to mention it more emphatically. And then after a while, she just said, "Hey, what do y'all think about going over here?" We weren't sure if Sister Debbie was at the Wildcat, or that's where we'd have landed. But we were driving down the road. I was praying about service. I was asking God to save your families that's lost. Yes. Asking God to save the sinners in our community and the backsliders. And I said to the Lord, what I've said so many other times, I said, you send them to me bruised and I'll love them. You send them to me broken and I'll love them. You send them to us battered and we'll love them. You send them to us in pieces and we'll love them. every piece you send in there. Y'all helping me this morning? I'm telling you, there's something to be said right here that the writer wanted the church to understand that we're not just taking the lame and shoving them over to the side. There's a way to handle a handicapped person. Yes, there is. We want them to get help. We want them to be healed. Let it rather be. That, that word rather comes from a word that's spelled M-A-L-L-O-N. Malon or Malon. Comes from a Hebrew word, Greek word, whatever it is. The Strong's Concordance, it's in the Bible 81 times. And I'm going to give you some instances real quickly here. It's the exact same word 
But it's translated into a different English word. Remember when Jesus said, your father sees the sparrows, his eyes on him, he knows where they fall. And he said, are you not of much more value than many sparrows? Remember that verse? That word more comes from the same real word right here that he said, let it rather be healed. Or more so, let it be healed. More than we want to turn you out, we want you to be healed. We want you rather to be healed. Remember when Jesus said, let them rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel? That's the same word. You remember where he said that the little woman came in the press behind him having an issue of blood for, for 12 years she had had that and was nothing better but rather grew worse. That's the same word. She more so grew worse. Moving on, he said it's more blessed to give than to receive. Much more now. Much more then being justified by his blood. When he wrote of the Hebrew writer wrote of Moses said that he chose rather suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. That's the exact same word. Help him, Jesus. He chose more so to suffer affliction than he did. Let not that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. I can't put every broken piece back together again, but I can love you. I can't erase everything in your past and take every bad memory away, but I can love you. Now, Jennifer, unless she slipped in, I know she did not see this set of notes because I literally wrote this out on a paper, stuck it in my Bible, and walked to the door. There's no way she saw it. At 9.40 something this morning, probably, I was still writing on this paper, so I know she didn't see that. But she didn't have any idea what I had wrote down here. You heard what she said. When you come to church and God saves you, we're going to love you. And us and God are not going to go deep sea diving with a snorkel in the sea of forgetfulness to try to dredge up your past. You remember that? Did anybody catch what she said a while ago? And we're not going to try to drag up everything you've ever done. When you come to the house of the Lord, we want you to rather be healed. We're not trying to turn you away. We're trying to heal you. Amen. I want the motto of my heart and my ministry to be, let it rather be yes. healed. Let it live. The scripture tells us that a live dog is better than a dead lion. I mean, the lion's the king of the jungle, king of the beast. I mean, he, he roars and all of the jungle listens to that roar of that mighty lion. I mean, he's powerful. He's huge. He can take down any creature in the forest. And if he can't take it down by himself, he has a pride lines that will help him. They work together. But the book said, the book said, it's right here, that a live dog, your little lap dog, Tinky, is better off. You'd be better off to have Tinky for protection than a dead lion laying on your porch. Tell the burglar comes to rob Sister Gail. Don't come in here. You see that dead lion right there? He's the king of the jungle. Well, he's dead. There's flies crawling in and out of his nose. He's got worms and maggots on him. But he's the king of the jungle. Don't you rob me. You know what they're going to do? They're going to crawl right over that lion's carcass. Come on in there and take what they want. But Tiki can save her life. You're better off. You're better off with a live dog than you are with a dead lion. I'm going to tell you something this morning. I don't want to stack up the carcasses of the perfect Mm -mm. and surround myself with a bunch of old dead, dry hypocrites and Amen. dead, dry perfection, I'd rather have a church full of live dogs than I had a church full of dead lions. Amen. Well, come on now. Nothing, Let not that which is lame be turned out of the way. Let it rather be healed. Yes. Job said years before this was ever written, Job said in chapter 7 of his book, there's hope for the tree. If it be cut out, there's hope for that tree. Why? It's going to grow again, Brother Junior. He said, though the tender branch is gone, he said its roots are in the ground. Amen. And the stalk's in the ground. And through the scent of water, it may bud and bring forth boughs like a plant. I remember Brother Dale Cropper and I, just a boy, preaching about mimosa trees. He said, you can dig up a big crater out in your yard. And he said, over here comes another mimosa tree, another mimosa tree, another mimosa tree. And you thought you had that thing dug up? I'm telling you what this morning. I'd rather take somebody that yes. wants to and cut down and look like there's no hope left for them. Oh, and Jesus. nobody wants them. And they got too much baggage with them. I'm telling you, if there's a root there, if there's a stump there, even when Nebuchadnezzar had the dream. Help him, God. 
They come tell him his dream. He said the stump was still on the ground. What that mean? What's the purpose? What good is a stump? A stump is what keeps those roots there. And it may grow again. Because there's a stump. I just read this this week. Where Brother Dillard, Sister Jean, quit fishing. Said he spent too much time hunting and fishing. He quit. And, and, and Brother Dillard's testimony was this. Now, you know, I didn't see it. Maybe some of you did. I don't know. I didn't see it. But Brother Dillard said he took his old cane pole. I guess it was a cane pole. I don't know. Just a pole. Branch. And he said he was walking in the house and decided I'm going to give myself to the gospel, not the fishing. And he stuck that pole in the ground in the corner of his garden. And Brother Dillard's testimony was that it grew roots and become a tree in the corner of his garden because he planted that thing. I'm telling you what, there's a lot of people around us this morning that don't look like they're much more valued than an old stick. They ain't much left to that. But you put that in the right kind of soil, in the right kind of yes. S-O-N sunlight, and you give that thing some nourishment and let the water of life come to it. And I'm telling you, it'll make a tree after a while. He yes. said like this, you are apple trees among the trees of the woods. Yes. You can take a branch out of an apple tree, put it in the live stump of a pine tree that's been cut out, and graft it in there. And with the right kind of nourishment, and somebody like Sister Jean that's got two green thumbs, <laughs> they can graft that in. I saw it. Saw things like that. And that pine tree root will produce apples out of that that's grafted in. And what did he say about us? You are a wild olive branch that's been grafted in. Woo! I'm telling you what, you just look at a bunch of sticks sitting around here this morning and look like a bunch of lameness to me. If you just start looking at every one of our lives and every one of our personal handicaps that don't look like much. But when he grafts us in, it starts changing the dynamic. Amos said like this, Amos 3 and 12, he said, as a shepherd takes out of the mouth of the lion two legs or a piece of an ear. Two legs? Right? Aren't sheep supposed to have four? Yeah. <laughs> Bless him, Jesus. Two legs and a piece of an ear. Don't sheep have two ears? Mm -hmm. And all we got left out of sheep. Okay? You all with me this morning? Help him, Help him, Jesus. We got sheep. Body, head, two ears, <coughs> four legs. When the line's done, there's two legs and a piece and one ear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's not much sheep left, is there? Mm -hmm. And the shepherd chases that line down. He tracks it down to where he took it. And he goes down to where the line's in his den. And he runs his arm down that line's <coughs> mouth. Yeah. And the Bible said he taketh out of the mouth of the line. There's leg number one. He reach around. There's leg number two. He reach around, fish around in there, and he's got, there's a piece of an ear. That's all I got left. That's my sheep. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to tell you something this morning. You may feel like you're sitting in this building today and there's nothing left of you but two legs or a piece Help of an ear. Jesus. But I'm preaching to you a God that's willing to run his hand in the lion's yes. mouth yes. and pull out that one leg and pull out another leg and pull out a piece of an ear. Let not that that is lame. Don't let it be turned out of the way. I'd like to, I'd, I'd like for God. Help him, God. You, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you why. That God don't convict sinners and backsliders and send them to certain homeless churches. Because they can't be trusted handling handicaps. Amen. That's Help right. That's right. You don't want Jeffrey Dahmer to lead your Boy Scout group, do you? <laughs> Come on now. You don't want Jeffrey Dahmer to run the church dinner. That's why God can't trust some people with handicaps. Because you know what they'll do to them? They'll knock them in the head and pitch them off in a ditch somewhere and forget about them. Yes. We had all them sows and ferret houses and raising show hogs and we as kids. And if one come out and it wasn't right, daddy would pick him up by the hind legs and knock him in the back of the head with a hammer and toss him in the pond. I said, well, never going to turn out and make anything. And that same mentality has bled into a lot of churches. If somebody comes in and we don't think they're just right, we'll pick them up and knock them in the back That's of the head and toss them in a pond. I hope God can trust me yes. and trust you and trust our church with a handicap or two. I hope God can trust me 
to handle a handicap right. Help him, Jesus. Help We're not just turning them out. Help him, Jesus. We want them to rather be healed. Yes. More so than yes. yes. to be healed. Help Praise him. God. I am on a treadmill having heart trouble several years ago and they told me I had some blockages. They had done the, tried to do the treadmill test. I began to black out. My blood pressure spiked. Chest pains. I started going out, blacking out. Down I went. I'm telling you, them nurses invaded that place. You know, they'd already told me you got to take your shirt off. So I untucked my shirt tail. I don't run around like that. I untucked my shirt tail. She said, uh, she said, how am I going to get these electrodes on you? I said, just run your hand up underneath there. I said, my heart's right over in here. <laughs> I'm feeling it there. She ran her hand up in there. She's eyes got big. She said, you have on an undershirt. I said, well, yes, ma'am. I do. I mean, I, I'm dressed, aren't I? I'm in town. I'm not running around half dressed. She said, i got to get inside that. I said, hang on. I'll untuck it. She said, it's tucked in. That's going to do much good. Creaked up my back, does it? <laughs> I let her in there and Run her hand up. She said, now what if I don't get this right on your heart? I said, oh, I got a big heart. <laughs> you just stick them things on this side of my sternum and you'll probably start picking up a bean over there somewhere. I got a big heart. They got me hooked up. She told me, she said, we really need you to take your clothes off. And I said, outside of my wife and my mama, you're bitch to be the only one ever seen me like this. She said, I do this every day. I said, I don't. <laughs> I don't always run around and ripping my clothes off everywhere I go. They got me all hooked up, got me on that, Brother Junior. I'm telling you, they invaded me. I started blacking out and I went to go down. My chest began to constrict, my breath stopped. That woman got stood up on the on the on the sides of that treadmill, had me by the jaws like this, one hand on each side. There's nurses all the way around hold me up, and she started slapping me back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. She said, Don't you go out on me, don't you go out on me. You stay with me, you hear me, you stay with me, you hear me. I've been raising my jaws back and forth, back and forth. But tell you what it was, she said, You're not gonna die on me right here. I'm fixing to get you some help. Sometimes on Sunday morning, I'm standing a strap in your head, and I've got you by the jaws, telling you, don't you die on me, don't you die on me, don't you die on me. I'm going to feel like you're going to go out there. I'm going to feel like you can't make it up. I'm telling you, don't you die on me. I'm not fixing to call the coroner. I'm fixing to get you in a position. I'm fixing to get you out. Glory to God. Woo! Don't you die on me. Don't you die on me. But I live. I tell you, I live. I feel like I'm running around sometimes. Mr. Gail grabbing people by the jaws and tell them, don't you die. Don't you die. Don't you die. And you don't understand what I've done. You don't understand what they said about me. Let's let what you say be turned down. I'm trying to learn how to tell a handicap. There's a way to do it. Get him to Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. She could have stood back and folded her hands around the turkey law system. He waited too long to come in. He ordained that. That plunged up his heart. Oh, it's his fault. You know. We all, Help him, you still here? That's how we do stand around the altar. They shouldn't own their man. They got themselves in that mess. They'll get themselves out of it. They made their bed let them leave. Yeah. Huh? Bless him, God. He didn't have to be 100 pounds overweight. He broke that heart attack on himself, Brother Brad. That's not how she. Let's call a coroner. Let's call the medical examiner. Let's call the funeral home. She got on that thing. I'm telling you, alarms went to going off. Buzzers started sounding. They started hollering, code this and code that. And in a few minutes, I'm telling you, that room was full of people in white coats. Uh, and they are in there to save my life. Uh, brother, I'm telling you this morning, uh, you can't see well, them. Thank God. Jesus. Hey, but there's angels in white. Yes. Uh, that are all around this room. Uh, they're here yes. to save your life. Uh, we're here to get you help. Uh, yes. We're here to help your help. I wish God would open every one of your eyes right now and you can see what's lying in these walls. The angels of the Lord yeah. in this building right now. And every one of them reaching out in your direction ready to help you. There's people in white robes. That's why he said, we're foreseeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let Come us on. run with patience. Let us put off the weight. Let us put off the sin. No, I'm telling you, I can make it. He said, brother, Justin, I'm handicapped. He goes from that handicap <clears throat> into talking about bitterness. And I 
and I don't have time to preach it all. I have to quit. Come on, Brady. Are you going to, your sister Gail Fair is going to play the same? I have to quit. But he immediately, he immediately transfers over from a handicap to bitterness. And I feel like I need to tell you something this morning. If you let that little root of bitterness grow in you, and it said that it trouble you. And spring up. Yes. Oh. Oh, help me, Lord. Thereby many. Oh. How many? Many. Be defiled. Handicaps have a way of transferring. Spiritual handicaps have a way of transferring. I feel like I need to tell you this morning, you need to pluck out that root of bitterness that you and me both know is starting to worm its little root down into the soil of your heart. I don't want to just turn you out of the way. I want it to be healed this morning. Yes, I'll tell you what that root will do. It springs up. If it springs up in me, it'll defile everybody in this building because I'll start spewing bitterness across this desk. Bitterness springs up in Brother Junior. It'll eventually affect Sister Carolyn. It'll eventually affect her children. If it springs up in Brianna, she goes back in that Sunday school room with a bitter root growing. It'll affect Caroline, Addison, Chloe. You say, Brother Justin, this is my handicap. Some people don't want to heal to their handicap because they don't want to lose their government check. You might as well say amen right there. Some folks would rather draw an income than they had to be able to say, I'm no longer handicapped. I've been to the great position. Some people would rather have a root of bitterness so they nurture it, let it grow, take care of it. It's my little root of bitterness. And he said, if he springs up in me, it's eventually going to defile many. Is it worth it? Is all those things that's hurt you and lamed you is it worth it? I, I, you may feel like, Brother Justin, you're slapping my jaws right now. But I'm trying to get you into a room that's filled up with folks in white robes that can get you some help. They got me on a gurney that day. 